Well, everybody, thanks so very much for being here. I'm Dr. David Morwood. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about neck rejuvenation. We started this series, I guess, a couple of years ago. It's called The Truth About Plastic Surgery. Basically, we started this series to educate people in the beauty industry about uh, what I see as the truth about plastic surgery. Because there's so many misconceptions on the internet and so many myths. And so we started this series to teach people about what I feel is the truth about plastic surgery, what it can do and what it can't do. And we've expanded it to the public, of course, basically because of popular demand. So I'm delighted to have you here. Um, I want to make sure everybody understands, if I say something that's not clear, then please let me know. You can raise your hand and I'll, I'll try to answer your question and make things more clear. And afterwards, we're gonna make time to uh, have some more beverages and treats. It all looks so good, it makes me hungry, even though I don't eat at night. Um, and we can probably chat a little bit. And I think you met Candace, right? Yes. You're gonna meet Heather, and Jerica's our videographer, and Alveda's serving, right? And um, I think people get some kind of special on consults, and you come in and learn about the Vectra, three-dimensional imager, et cetera. So, Without an introduction, thanks very much for being here, everyone. Now, um, some people uh, ask me why it's called plastic surgery. They say, is it because you use a lot of plastic or silicone? Actually, the root of plastics um, is plastico, plastic surgery to mold, shape, and tailor. That's what we do. And of course, sometimes people think they're vain because they're concerned about their appearance. Actually, it's healthy. It's normal human nature to want to look your best. When we see someone on the street that's not concerned about their appearance, then we recognize that something is a kilter, something's not right. And of course, the face is a very powerful tool of communication. Number one, and plastic surgeons and sociologists study these things. The number one way we communicate, of course, is with the voice. But second to that is the face and the eyes that convey emotions. And for some of us, different ethnic backgrounds, uh, we use our limbs to communicate, and of course, body language is very important. But uh, second only to the voice, the face and eyes convey emotions. The neck, of course, is vital um, to set a foundation for beauty and being attractive for both men and women. Most people can look at a person, and I, th I think there used to be this dishwashing liquid commercial, the hands give away your age. Oftentimes it's the neck, and I find a lot of people think they need a facelift, what they really need is a neck lift, and there's a lot of people that would be uncomfortable having a facelift, but they need a neck rejuvenation, and it's one of my favorite things to do. So I want to go through these things quickly. A lot of this is applicable to uh, aging of the face, but what happens when we age? Uh, you know, the skin has te texture and pigment changes, it can lose resilience, the fat can atrophy. We actually lose fat in our face and in our hands, and we gain weight in our trunk as we mature. It's what a, what a dirty trick, right? So we lose fat in our hands and our face, and we gain weight in our trunk. Fascia is the connective tissue in the body that rides on every muscle, and it sometimes goes in the fatty layer. That can lose its resilience. Muscle tone, muscle, of course, less tone and mass. Cartilage can lose resilience. Sometimes cartilage increases in size with age. The nose can get bigger, the ears can get bigger. And the bone, the craniofacial skeleton, actually can get smaller. So most people, when they see someone, they can guess roughly what their age is. And they certainly can tell people who are 50 years apart. We just genetically, it's like built into our, our system, our neurologic system, that we can recognize people older and younger. Now some of the signs of aging are predictable, some are not. But one of the big take home messages I wanna leave you with today is that every patient that comes into my office deserves a custom designed approach. You know, on the internet, and sometimes you'll see in the paper, and you hear on the radio, sign up for this magic lift, and this lift, and this special thing, you get in line, and everybody gets the same thing. It's like a cookie cutter approach. I don't believe in that. Everybody's face is different. Everybody ages differently. So custom designed approach. Some of the changes are predictable, and that we can count on being able to reverse those changes, or at least mitigate them. But essentially, my approach is to have people look natural, if you are 60, I want you to look the best possible 60. If you're 110, I want you to look the best possible 110. And when we talk about the neck lift, or neck rejuvenation, natural neck lift, oftentimes it's, it, oftentimes it's very helpful for young people as well. So, 
let's just briefly talk about some anatomy. I think it's very important. For the natural neck lift, as well as any area of plastic surgery, we need to know the anatomy because high quality plastic surgery is reflected with a accurate knowledge of the anatomy. The epidermis is what we see. That's on top. Now the very top layer of the epidermis isn't really living. Now the epidermis is on top of the dermis. Under that's the subcutaneous tissue. Overlying the muscle is the fascia. And, and then there's the muscle, of course. And there's a periosteum, which is a lining of the bone, and then the bone itself. Now the epidermis rides on top of the dermis. Now, everyone in California uh, loves to be outdoors. A lot of us, that's why we came here. But of course, the sun is not our friend, especially for places like the upper chest and the neck and the face. You know, I don't, this is kind of a, comp we're, I have a few complicated slides that I'm going to go through quickly, but I want you to know that, that what we can do is actually skin biopsies and show histologic changes for sun exposure. And there are some things we can do to help mitigate that. There's some things we can do to help reverse that. And the neck is a very special area. Now, this first biopsy I'm showing is an area with very little sun exposure. And then here's, come on in. Happy you're here. Thank you for coming. Uh, there's a chair there, and there's a couple chairs up front. Now, let me back up one second. Okay, so this is a skin biopsy of an area of, of skin that has not had very much sun exposure. Here's an area that has a lot of sun exposure. Everybody's familiar with that term, liver spot, age spot, sun spot. There's less collagen, less hyal hyaluronic acids, less elastin. So I'm a big believer in skin care, facials, taking good care of your skin. Everybody knows how important it is to take care of your teeth, right? You see the dentist or the hygienist two, three times a year, and then you get into a home program. I think having an esthetician, getting facials every once in a while is a good idea, and learn how to take care of your skin at home. And there are some essentials, and these are really vital for the, for the thin skin of the neck. So first of all, what can we do? Avoid sun. Everybody loves the sun, but the UV rays are really not our friend. <coughs> Properly cleanse, exfoliate. I mentioned to you that the very top layer of skin in all of us is not really living. It's like nails and hair. It's not alive. And that keratin layer can get really thick. So we want to start to thin that out, and we want to encourage sh rapid shedding of the sun damaged skin. Now, restoration, we want to encourage the layer where the baby cells are made. We want to turn that factory on. And there are ways that we can do that, encourage more baby cells. What I want you to remember is that it takes, six, uh, it takes 30 days for a new cell from the germinal matrix to get to the top where you can even see it. So sometimes I see people who have tried skincare for a couple of weeks and they say, oh, doc, you know, I really don't see much difference. Well, you haven't even given the baby cell even one chance, even one cycle to get to the top where you can see it. That's 30 days. So just imagine if you do it for six months. And so you go through, go through six cycles. Or what if you, you give yourself 12 months and you go through 12 cycles of regeneration. So I, I'm a real believer in it. Moisturizing is very important. And... Uh, second to avoiding smoking, uh, excuse me, avoiding the sun is avoiding smoking. Everybody's heard the word uh, antioxidants, you know, cranberries and pomegranates and things you can take. Antioxidants, well, smoking is a terrible oxidizer. It's like rusting. The microvascular channels and cells almost get rusted. Uh, I'm going to skip that. So a foundation for an attractive face, beautiful face, handsome face, both men and women, is a crisp, clean neck. Now, there are some things we can do even before we get to surgery, of course, and we're big on that. Not everybody needs surgery. Cosmetic non-invasive treatment. I talked about facials. It's important to take care of your skin. Microdermabrasion, that's we encourage rapid exfoliation. Fruit acid light peels, IP, intense pulse light, IPL. Radio frequency and external ultrasound. I put those in parentheses because I think they're rather experimental. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Botox and Dysport fillers, peels, ablative lasers, dermabrasion, and of course sclerotherapy I won't talk much about, but that's injecting veins. Now, what I want to mention again is that the epidermis is on top of the dermis, and collagen is the basic building block, built basic building protein block in our body. There's collagen in our skin, there's elastin in our skin, there's hyaluronic acids, acids in our skin. If we compare the skin of a young child to a person that's had lots of sun exposure, in their 60s, 
in the, the older person there's less hyaluronic acids, less elastin, less collagen, and more disorderly collagen. So there are things we can do to encourage um, more collagen, hyaluronic acids, and elastin, etc. Retinoic acids, everybody's heard of uh, Retin-A probably, vitamin C treatments, some CO2 lasers, and some fillers. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just um, if you come in and see me or see an esthetician or talk to a dermatologist, there are actually things we can do, as I said, to improve the, the on a cellular layer, improve the health of the skin. Very much equivalent to taking care of your teeth in a regimen at home and seeing the hygienist and dentist two, two times a year, etc. So for example, here's a skin biopsy um, of an area that has had some sun exposure, and this is six months later after proper skin care. You see much thicker, more collagen, less keratin layer, etc. Finer skin. Now, I want to make an emphasis about something. Cosmetic treatments do not remove extra skin or dramatically tighten loose skin. Things that we do like peels, lasers, some facials that we do, fruit acid peels, etc., that takes care of the texture of the skin, but it doesn't dramatically tighten loose skin or remove extra skin. Now that's important to emphasize. Now, I'm going to show another slide where the converse is just as true, that the plastic surgeon cannot operate away wrinkles. So when I see someone in the office, we need to look at three essential parameters. We, look, we need to look at volume. Remember I said that we lose volume in the face, we lose fat in the face. We need to look at the skin, and then we, look, we, need, we need to look at the amount of skin and where it is, and if it needs lifting or firming or repositioning. So there's three separate factors that we need to look at. And we cannot really interchange those things. Some people I see in the office only need volume restoration, and we talk about that. Some people only need skin treatment. Other people just need surgery or sur soft tissue repositioning. So custom designed approach. I think that's vital, very important. Now, I'm not, certainly I'm not denigrating those treatments like lasers and chemical peels. In fact, I want to show you an example. A friend of mine lent this to me, this slide. Um, if you compare before and after, fine lines are lessened, pigment changes are lessened, the texture of the skin is improved, but there has not been an improvement in the amount of the skin and, and it has not tightened loose skin. So that's a laser. Now I want to try to emphasize and teach about this. Most people are familiar with bacon, right? It's moist, supple, you can almost tie it in a knot. Now if you heat it, 100% we know that the protein shrinks, but at the same time it becomes brittle. You could break it, right? And what, we're what we are trying to do when I talked about the skin, we want supple, hydrated, smooth, soft, really supple skin. So we've got to be very careful when we heat the skin expecting that a laser could do the same thing that a facelift can do. So a custom designed approach. Now this slide I show, um, the reason I show this is because when the only tool you own is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail, of course. So what we need to do is design a custom approach for everybody who comes in. I meet with everybody, you meet with my staff, we like to do the Vectra. That's the six camera computer photo imager. If everybody has time tonight, take a look. It's, a, it's an amazing piece of technology. Uh, the six cameras and it feeds your data, your image into the computer and we can sit there with you and manipulate it and it's three dimensions where you can turn you around and you can look at different parts of your body, your neck, your, your eyes, etc. It's very helpful as a communication tool and we can also do some sculpting and give you an idea of what different procedures can do. Now, this is an important slide because we're talking about natural neck lift tonight and neck rejuvenation. The skin of the neck is delicate and has far fewer pilosebaceous appendages than does the face. Well, what do I mean by pilosebaceous appendages? Less sweat glands, less oil glands, less hair, right? Though when we refinish the skin with laser or some peels, we rely upon those appendages to help resurface. The, the neck has to be treated very delicately. The neck and the upper chest, some women call that the décolletage, right? We need to be very careful. Um, I can be a little more aggressive on the face than I can on the neck, when I'm treating the skin. Um, the thicker parts of the face I can be quite aggressive for. For example, around the mouth for the fine lines, the forehead, I can be aggressive on. Eyelid skin I'm very careful, very delicate with. 
very delicate and judicious with the skin of the neck. That's something that I want you to know. Now, I talked a little bit about laser. One of the things that I like is a TCA peel. It has similar effects. I, I feel like I can control it a lot. Now, the next slide I'm about to show, um, this scalp does not need anything, any plastic surgery. But what I like to do, if you come into for a consultation, I encourage people to bring in photographs from years prior. I love to see baby pictures and graduation pictures and what you were like in college and driver's license pictures from the 10s and 20s and 30s, et cetera, et cetera. So bring them in so we can study how your soft tissue has changed, what about your fat compartments, how much fat have you lost, et cetera. So this is a gal, uh, I think this was her college graduation picture, and here she is, eyes blocked out, of course, about 50 years later. So what I did for her, and, and look at her neck. What I did for her is some soft tissue firming and repositioning, and we helped resurface her skin, and we helped her with some volume. Now please keep in mind, I talk about three, so think of the triangle, or think of a pyramid, right? Three important parameters. Volume, the skin, and soft tissue position and soft tissue volume, okay? So here she is um, before the surgery. Now look at, you can look at the whole face, but you can look at her neck because we're talking about the natural neck lift. Okay, so it's firmer, smoother, that, lay, that serves a, a much better foundation for a very attractive, beautiful face. Now, my wonderful staff has taught me over the years that when I give these talks, people are not accustomed to seeing patients coming out of the operating room. I got it. Okay, so I, I'm saying that now because the next slide I'm going to show is this woman about one week after resurfacing and surgical positioning, etc. Okay, so as I said, yeah, see, yeah, I, after the oohs and the yeah, ahs, yeah. then I get the groans, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> predictable. So remember I said I can be a little more aggressive among the mouth, that's th uh, that really thick skin, and very easy, very delicate around the eyelid, or I black at her eyelids, she asked us to. Oh, by the way, all these patients are mine, if they're not mine, then I'm going to tell you. Uh, none of the celebrities are, are <laughs> my patients. I, I operate on those celebrities, but I, I have not operated on these celebrities. I do op operate on celebrities, but not in this talk. The point is, is that all these people gave permission to use their pictures for education. If you are the kind of person and it's okay with us, if you don't want your pictures used, you just tell us ahead of time. It's fine. So. That's her about a week after resurfacing, soft tissue positioning, and a little <coughs> revolumization. Okay. Now, here's another gal who came in and wanted some lower third of the face rejuvenation. Right. Um, most of these pictures I'm going to show tonight, as I said, they're actual my patients before and afters. Um, we're going to focus on the lower third of the face again. Now, if you look at her, think of a uh, a, a balloon where you let a little bit of the air out. That's what happens when we lose volume from the face and the hands, right? And we gain weight in the trunk. So it looks to me like she's just missing a little volume. So soft tissue position, repositioning <clears throat> judiciously, right? Conservatively. I don't want to stretch people too hard. A little bit of revolumizing, and then we and we want to refinish the skin. Same day, okay? Either in the office here or in the operating room. So this is her about six days later. She's peeling. So what happens after a TCA peel? Nothing happens for four or five days. And then for four or five days, you rapidly exfoliate. exfoliate. You're left with some pink skin, and over about the next three to six weeks, a lot of that pinkness, redness goes away, and you're left with smoother skin. So there she is about eight, ten weeks later. Should I back up so you can see her... Okay, so you, doesn't she doesn't she look like she's like missing volume, right? Like we let a little water out of a balloon, etc. There she is about eight days afterward, and there she is about eight weeks later. Okay, starting to get the idea. So when we look at the neck, I do want to look at the face as well, but we need to again custom designed approach, triangle. Think of the pyramid, volume, soft tissue positioning and the, the actual texture of the skin. Okay, now, everybody knows about Botox, right? What is Botox? Bustle, Botox is a muscle relaxant. I'm gonna go through this rapidly. It started out as a medical surgical treatment. I did Botox many years ago at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles when I was a microsurgery fellow for children with facial asymmetry. It works great. 
Um, it's a, it started out, I think, in first surgical use was to help children with like cross-eyes esotropia and you know the ex exotropia where the eyes would wander or, or be kind of wall-eyed to help balance <coughs> out those muscles. So it's a muscle relaxant. And I can I sometimes use it for any muscle spasm of the hand. Hyperhidrosis, it helps for people with excess sweating. It can help in migraines. Now, I show this slide, it's not the neck, but I want to talk to you a little bit about how we use Botox to relax certain muscles and how we use it to our advantage to do conservative facial shaping, especially around the brows. Now, we know that there are three muscles, if you can look at me for a moment, there are three muscles that depress the brows, the orbicularis oculi, the corrugator, and the procerus, right? So those three muscles depress the brows. There's one major elevator of the brow, that's the frontalis muscle. So if we use Botox and we use our knowledge of the anatomy to selectively have the depressors relax, and selectively let some of the elevators take over, we can conservatively shape the brows and give a little bit of a lift and get the so-called 1s and 11s and 111s to relax in the glabella here. The glabella is this place in between the eyebrows, okay, at the root of the nose. That's the glabella. The company likes to call those the 1s or the 11s or the 111s, okay? So as an example, I'm going to get to the neck, but I want to show some of these pictures because it's, they're very illustrative of how we use Botox to affect people's appearance and oftentimes how they feel, uh, you know, for migraines and tension. And there's been there's actually been studies for some people who have certain types of depression. If they feel like they're always scowling and they're kind of all, they're always kind of down on something, if we get those muscles to relax, oftentimes they actually feel better. So here's a gal who deals with the public a lot. Her clients kept saying to her, "Are you in a bad mood? Are you tired? Did you not sleep well last night?" She's an upbeat, <laughs> really uh, energetic person. She came to me. This is what she was on day one. Two weeks after Botox, she's trying to give that same expression. Okay, so it's a muscle relaxant. It works great around the eyes. I'm going to get to how we use it in the neck. I'm very judicious around the mouth. I don't like to change people's smiles. I think if you beautiful smiles, it's worth the, the fine lines. But it's great around the eyes, and I like it for certain indications of the neck. Here's just another example. I asked her to give me a look of discernment or a look of disapproval. Two weeks later, after Botox, there we go. Here's another example. Now, sometimes I use fillers. I'm going to get when I talk about volume. For someone who has a static line, in other words, we give Botox and we get their muscles to relax, but they still have a line there we can get even more improvement with a filler, in other words, a volumizer. So this is what this gal got. Okay, now, what about the neck? Since tonight we're talking about the natural neck lift. The platysma muscle is the muscle in our neck that makes bands and can make people think that they have a lot of loose skin, but it's really lacks muscular support, or it's really lacks support for the muscle. Now, how does Botox help that? If we get that muscle to relax, it can fall back and actually have a longer length fall back into the cervical <clears throat> mental angle than if it's shortened and lacks support and falls forward. It almost, it, it almost is counterintuitive, but it helps for mild platysmal bands. So here's a gal who had these early mild platysmal bands, a little bit of Botox here in the office, and there she is about two weeks later. Okay, so it can help for that. So I talked about skin care for the neck and face. I talked about Botox for early platysmal changes. Now, I mentioned filler briefly when I was talking about the gobella. Um, what are fillers? You know, probably by now everybody's heard of collagen and Juvederm and Bello, there's a new one called Bellotero that my patients like and we just are starting to get something called Silk and there's Restylane. There's about a new filler every month. They have their <coughs> really good indications um, they can help fill lines, they plump up tissue, and non-surgical facial sculpting. For certain indications, I like to give people higher cheekbones. We can bring the chin forward. Sometimes we can redefine the angle of the mandible in the back if someone is not ready for surgery, etc. I like fat sometimes, and I'll talk about fat. I like filler sometimes. There's pros and cons. Now, remember before I said all these patients are mine that I'm showing you? This next this next picture is out of New Beauty magazine that I've been in. It's something called the liquid facelift, only Botox and fillers. So you can get some help. 
in the right, in, for the right indications. Now, I mentioned fillers, right? Fillers are things that we take out of a box, they come sterile, they're in a syringe, and we inject them, right? We have to pay for the filler, we have to buy it. Um, it's a needle that we use to get it in, but, but it, for some indications, it's great. Now, remember how I talked about we lose fat in our face and in our hands, and we gain weight in our trunk, right? There's another way we can take advantage of that fatty tissue. We can do conservative liposuction of an area that has not had a lot of sun exposure, like the tummy or the flanks, right, the outer hips. Conservative amount of liposuction. We can decant it or centrifuge it. We kind of wash it, um, and we transpose it or graft it to another place. Today, I, I did some of this two and a half hours ago and before I got cleaned up. We can do it for higher cheekbones, to fill in some lines, we can do it for breast augmentation. We, I just did a case of buttock augmentation that's called a Brazilian butt lift. What, what does it do? It replaces volume. It's kind of a natural filler. We do bring up some stem cells. I don't call it a stem cell facelift. I'm board certified and I'm a member of the society. The society does not advocate the use of that term. One out of every 176 cells we bring up is a stem cell. There are some estrogen receptors. A lot of the women that we do fat grafting for, for the cheekbones, will come in a few months later and say that they notice their skin is smoother. It's because that's, I think it's the estrogen receptors. Now, why, do I, why did I list the grape raisin principle? Keep in mind, in California, of course, we have the sun. And our hands and face get exposed to the sun. We lose fat in our face and our hands. We gain weight in our trunk. Well, think of the succulent very hydrated grape out in the sun for a while and it becomes the raisin. So perhaps, I don't like to use the word the, the old the old style, maybe the traditional style of facelifting where we make incisions and pull really hard, we pull so hard that the wrinkles come out and then we cut off the extra skin and sew up quickly before the skin kind of springs back. Sometimes that gave people kind of a flattened appearance. What I like to do is rehydrate the raisin, refill the raisin, revolumize. What I, I call that a volumetric facial rejuvenation in, or neck lift instead of just a facelift. What we want to do, you've heard this before, custom designed approach, the triangle, volume, soft tissue positioning, and skin, right? So instead of, think of that raisin, instead of pulling that skin so tight that all the wrinkles come off and then, and then we sew it up, why don't we rehydrate? And revolumize and, and become more like a grape. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples. Focus, focusing on rejuvenation of the lower third of the face. Okay, so here's a gal um, who has nice skin. How old she, is she? Roughly 55. Nice skin, and, <coughs> and when I look at her, she lost a little bit of volume. Right? Which allows gravity to act and pull tissues down. So let's, instead of pulling really tight, mm -hmm. let's revolumize, let's do conservative soft tissue positioning, hopefully for a more natural, cleaner, crisper <coughs> look. So that's, this was done in the office, like conservative that. repositioning. Okay? Starting to get the idea of what, a, what, a, what I mean by <coughs> volumetric rejuvenation. Okay? Let's look at the volume, let's look at the skin, let's look at the soft tissue. Now, here, here we see a little bit of volume loss so that allows gravity to kind of pull down on tissues, right? Let's revolumize conservative soft tissue positioning, okay, to rejuvenate the lower third of the face. Starting to get the idea, volumetric rejuvenation of the face and neck. So yes. this isn't cut and stitch, this is inject, inject. Oh, oh okay. <coughs> see, that's a great question. It's a combination oh. of revolumization and soft tissue repositioning. Sometimes we do only injecting, sometimes we do only fat grafting, sometimes we do only soft tissue positioning, sometimes we recommend <coughs> only skin care. Custom designed approach, okay? Okay, I tried to put, every once in a while, put a piece of my favorite sculptor. Everybody knows this is <coughs> Rodin. Everybody knows that, right? Most. Next time you go to Paris, go to that museum. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about surgery. When I see you in the office and you're interested in a neck rejuvenation or lower third of the face or whatever, whatever it is that you're interested in, that's how I want to start. 
I say to people, you meet my staff, <coughs> the director, what is it that you would like to change? It's not, I mean, if someone asks me, and they say, Doctor, well, what do you think? I have no shortage of opinions. I'm happy to offer to you what I think. But I really want to know what it is that you want to change. I mean, what's going on in your mind? And most plastic surgeons, as I do, look at the face in thirds. There's the top third around the eyes. There's the mid face, right, the cheeks. And then there's a lower third of the face, which is essentially the neck and jowls. So um, we're going to concentrate on the lower third of the face during this lecture. How's everybody doing? Am I, uh, hope I'm not boring anybody. <laughs> so the other important issue, if you're going to have neck rejuvenation or facial rejuvenation, whatever it is that you're interested in, is where should I have the procedure? Um, if I have time, we're going to talk some more about the different places, but we have a, an operatory here in the office, downstairs, we're very lucky, we have a surgery center that's board cert that's certified, licensed, and accredited, I'm the chief at the division of plastic surgery at the hospital, so we can go to the hospital when that's needed, so we have the office, we have the surgery center, and we have the hospital. So what, what happens in the office? We can do mini lifts, Okay, mini lifts, and now you're going to see this again. Limited incision facial lifts. Every client needs, not only deserves, but they need a custom designed approach. Let's back up for a moment. Everybody remember, perhaps everybody remembers the sort of older style way to get your gallbladder out, right? Big incision. I used to do that kind of surgery. Big incision, big scar. Surgeon, we put both our hands in there and manipulate the liver and the, the gallbladder and all that stuff. Now, very small incisions, right? We call that Band-Aid surgery. We put in the laparoscope. Plastic surgeons are the same way. We're trying to do more and more with smaller incisions. In general, when I need to manipulate <coughs> lots of skin or remove lots of skin, that we make longer incisions. If all I'm trying to do is gain access, in general, that's smaller incisions. I use fiber optics uh, and magnification so I can get into a smaller incision and manipulate tissue. So sometimes people get a long incision, sometimes people get a short incision. There's combinations of these incisions, etc. Custom designed approach. And so that's why everybody who comes in meets my wonderful staff and they spend time with me and we do the Vectra and because I want people to be educated. Okay, so let's show some mini lifts done in the office. Here's a gal who came in, good looking girl, um, nice skin, but she doesn't need a huge neck lift, she doesn't need a huge facelift. What she just needs is some conservative repositioning of the soft tissue through short incisions. Here's a gal with a little bit of change in her neck. She doesn't need um, a lot of big incisions or big facelift neck lift. She just needs a small incision. It's called a short scar approach. Okay? Starting to get the idea? Do you see a... Let me back up. You go, we go from there. See under the chin. We go from there to there. Short scar. Here's a gal who just needs a little conservative repositioning, just kind of wanted a kind of a pick-me-up operation, so there she is. Here's a gal with early platysmal changes. She wanted something more permanent than Botox. Mini neck lift done in the office through a short incision. Okay, starting to get the idea. So the natural neck lift, custom design approach. We want to tell people what I think you need. We'll go through your options and custom design approach for you. Yes? So the incision, even for the neck lift, is around the ears. It, sometimes I make it just under the chin. So, you know, sometimes they just need Botox. Sometimes it's around the ears. Sometimes it's under the chin as well. Custom designed approach. And that's something that we can talk about when we do consultation. And what about the anesthesia? Okay, great idea. Great question. I'll get that, to that. That's my concern. Okay, so sometimes we do things in the office with local and oral sedation. That's what I must recommend to you because they say that you do local. Okay, everybody, custom designed approach. People have to be healthy enough to have a procedure under local uh -huh. and can tolerate the injections. They, in general, have, we have shorter procedures in the office. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's something that we can also talk about. I think um, this next picture was, I think I, I think I took this as I, as I was falling over or something. <laughs> so here's a gal who just wanted a, a little facial rejuvenation, short scar done in the office, a little pick-me-up, short incision. Here's a gal with some changes in the lower third of her face, okay? She did not need a long incision, just a shorter incision. 
to do that kind of thing. A lot of these things we can do, most of the, what I'm showing now we can do in the office, shorter procedures. Now, I think I did this woman in the office as well. Now, here's a great teaching case. If you look at her again, she's got some skin changes, right? Some pigment changes from sun exposure. She's lost volume, so we want to address the volume change, and she needs some, she needs some soft tissue tightening and refirming, right? So when you look at her post-op picture, doesn't she almost seem like she's a little, a little more volumized, almost a little wider? Let me back up. Okay, look at her there, and here she is about three months later. Doesn't she look a little more volumized? More of like her high school graduation picture, or her college graduation picture. Here's another gal, um, really great looking facial structure, but she's lost volume. So we do a little skin resurfacing, a little soft tissue positioning, revolumization. Now, um, another word about fat grafting. Fat grafting is great for the mid face, especially for ladies. Sometimes we get what's called submalar hollowing. Sometimes women, some men, this is what I call the malar areas, you know, the cheekbones. All the models have high cheekbones, whether you're guys or gals. All the models have high cheekbones, and some people get a little submalar wasting. Fat grafting is great for that. So here she is a few months later after fat grafting. Here's a really good looking girl who felt like she need, she had, was, she's really good looking, she's losing volume in her cheekbones. So in the office, this is done with filler. Somebody asked me about the difference between filler and fat grafting. So filler comes in the syringe, it's sterile, right? We inject it with a needle. Fat grafting, we do a little conservative liposuction, decant the fat or spin it down and re-inject it. So there she is, now look at her cheekbones, right? Look at the malar areas and look at her, look at her after some um, filler. So there's pros and cons. Okay, now, what about perioral rejuvenation? I want to get to that, and I'm going to go through that quickly um, before I go on to more surgical cases of a neck lift. Perioral lines, a lot of women come in and say, you know, they got the smoker's lines even though they don't smoke. Their lipstick runs up into those lines. Essentially, what we're trying to do is take down the hills so that not, there's not so much distance between the valley and the hill, right? Think of a mountain near the valley. So we want to do that with something like dermabrasion, it works great, or a laser, or some aggressive TCA peel that I like doing. Here's a gal who had pretty deep, even though she didn't smoke, smoker's lines, and here she is after some conservative resurfacing, well, fairly aggressive resurfacing of those lines. So, I talked about Botox, I talked about fillers, I talked about fat grafting, I talked about some revolumization. I want to talk a little bit more about the natural neck lift. What is the natural neck lift? A si it's a system of careful analysis evaluating appearance, anatomy, and goals with a custom designed approach, okay? It's a system. So if you're concerned about your neck or the lower third of the face, it's very similar to being concerned about any other part of the body. We've got to go layer by layer, step by step. I want to know what your concern is, what's bothering you, what do you want to change, We've got to look at the skin, we've got to look at the subcutaneous fat, the fascia, the muscle, and the bone. So as I said before, high quality plastic surgery starts with an accurate knowledge of the anatomy. So there's fat in the neck. Let me talk a little bit about liposuction. Um, liposuction is done with a cannula. It's a tube. I make for the neck and cervical area, I make three small incisions, one tiny incision in the submental crease. Most Americans that I meet already have a scar under their chin because their little brother pushed them on the bike or they fell down the stairs or they tripped on the sidewalk one day. So I make one little incision here. Usually people have a scar there anyway. And then I make one little incision where the earlobe meets the cheek on each side. And that way I, I gain access to the, to the um, fatty layer. I'm not going to go through the whole history of liposuction. We could talk about that for hours. But <coughs> suffice to say that I like blunt cannulas. I, I don't use sharp cannulas. I, we know where the fatty layer is, and what we do is numb up that fatty layer, numb up the skin, and we pass the cannula in there, and I mold and shape and tailor, and I do that myself. It's not, what I do is not putting in a probe, a heat probe or a laser probe, and plugging it in and letting it sizzle while certain practitioners or people leave the room. It's me doing it manually, it's like sculpting, it's hand done. So I mold and shape and tailor as I go. And we make those channels. And what we do is bring the skin closer to the muscular layer. 
Now, I like what, what I call the super wet technique, especially in the office. What I do is numb up the skin, then I put a fluid into the deeper tissues, it's called Hunstead's formula. And what that does is basal constrict the vessel, it constricts the vessels, and it loosens up the fat, it makes it numb, and it's a blunt cannula, so there's very minimal oozing of, of blood, etc. So, liposuction, common areas. For the women, under the chin, the submentum, axillary and pectoral folds, the waist, outer thighs. My, my staff have warned me, if I use the term saddlebags, then they give me demerits, so I don't no longer use those terms. For men, submentum under the chin, I don't know why, but they say it's okay that I say the term love handles for the lower flanks of the abdomen. So, natural neck lift. Here's a gal who came in my office and she wanted a nicer looking neck, okay? Now, she's relatively young, she has extra, she has extra fat, and she has good skin. So, did I do a big operation, natural neck lift, platysmoplasty for her? No. Liposuction only, one little incision in the submentum, one little incision at where each earlobe meets the cheek, and there she is, okay? So, keep in mind that she's a candidate for that operation, that procedure. Custom designed approach, right? Getting the idea, everybody deserves that. Okay, it works great for guys too. A little bit of uh, baby fat under the chin, three little incisions done in the office. Here's a gal who didn't really need a lot done. Uh, I didn't want to do a lot for her, but a little conservative liposuction is just right. As I said, it works great for guys. For men, the natural neck lift really gives a great foundation to a handsome face. Now, here's a guy who came in and he said, I know I have a, some extra skin. Uh, I don't want a big operation. Just try liposuction and see what helps. See, see, see what happens. So we did that for him. He knew it. He has a little extra skin afterward but he got some improvement. So the question is, will, sometimes people ask, will liposuction work for me? Well, we've got to look at the surrounding tissues. We've got to look at the deeper tissues, we've got to look at the more superficial tissues. Here's a gal who came in and I said, you know, you're kind of on the borderline between needing a little bit of skin tightened up and just liposuction. And she said, well, why don't we try the liposuction? And I said, you may have a little bit of extra skin afterwards. She says, well, let's try it, I know it. So there she is afterwards with improved contour, a little bit of extra skin, but for her, that's what she was, she was fine. Custom designed approach, right? Similar thing, conservative liposuction, leave the skin alone, improved contour, okay? So, what about someone who does have extra skin? If I were to do just liposuction on that person, they're going to be left with maybe even more extra skin, right? Because we're taking away volume. So we've got to design, properly design a custom approach, right? So, and there's all kinds of different approaches. Usually there, if it's the neck only, I go behind the ears. So, remember I told you that I encourage people to bring in photos? So here's a gal, I think she was just graduating from nursing school. Here she is about 50 years later, quite a bit of sun damage. Now, the point I'm making is, again, my patient, if I had offered her just liposuction, she would have liked, there was a high probability she would go into the unsatisfied category and we like as close as we can to 100% delighted patients, right? So she got some skin tightening and repositioning and excision, okay? That's not liposuction. Now here's a gal with a really good looking foundation for her, excuse me, for her face. Yes, I removed a little bit of fat, but she needed some skin tightening as well. So we go from there to there. Okay, starting to get the idea. A little bit of skin tightening, skin excision, repositioning. Here's a gal who would probably not have been satisfied with just liposuction, so we do a mini incision and tailor the skin. Here's a gal who has a little bit of extra fat. Uh, I did not take this picture, her husband took this picture. You can see it's not really medically set up. A little bit of extra skin, I took out a little bit of fat, repositioned her skin, helped tighten it, smoothed out her skin. Okay, starting to get the idea. Now, similar, here's a gal who lost some volume, so I helped re-volumize her and repositioned and took away some of the skin. Okay, starting to get the idea. You saw some cases of the boat, you saw a couple cases of Botox only, skin resurfacing only, uh, liposuction only, liposuction in combination with skin tightening, 
right? Custom designed approach, starting to get the idea. So this picture I show, who rides horses here, anybody? Ah, oh, yes. Do you know what the platysma muscle does in the horse? So the platysma, this is fast, I love anatomy. Um, the platysma muscle in the horse, just like us, starts at the jaw. The platysma muscle in our species starts at the jaw, but it stops at the clavicles. It has no function in us. It's like vestigial. It's like the appendix. So it has no function other than to give plastic surgeons work. But, <laughs> but in the horse, it runs three quarters of the way down the body, and it lets the horse shiver. So it shivers off the flies. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now, you realize that that sound effect is going to appear in our senses. Yeah. Yeah. Get that. Well, Jerica, I hope you got that on it. Okay, so now we talked about the skin, we talked about Botox, we talked about resurfacing, we talked about the fatty layer. One layer deeper. What happens if that platysma muscle is dramatically lax? Then if I affect the fat only or if I affect the skin only, it's not probably not going to be enough. So these people get a platysma plasty. Somebody asked a question about where I make the incisions. If there's lots of laxity in the platysma muscle, I make a little incision in the crease. If there's not so much, I come from the side, usually from behind the ears, and I can firm up the muscle. What we like to have is a hammock, right? We use that muscle as a hammock to support the deeper tissues, to give a prettier... We, we have this uh, uh, phrase in plastic surgery, cervical mental angle. It's the angle of the neck, right? For both men and women, we like that to be crisp and clean. Okay, so a platysma plasty. Remember uh, the Greek word plasty? Mold, shape, tailor, reshaping the platysma. Okay, let's show some examples of that. This gal does not have a lot of extra skin, but her platysma muscle is loose. What does she get? Platysma plasty. This woman has some extra skin, but her platysma is dramatically loose. She gets a little bit of skin tightening and excision, and a platysma plasty. Okay, starting to see the difference, or starting to get the idea. What we need to do was it Willie Sutton? Somebody said, "Why do you rob banks?" He goes, "That's where the money is." Yeah. That what we want to do is aim our therapy to what is needed, right? We want to hit the ball where the fielders are not, so we make home runs and get around the bases. Okay, so here's a gal with some extra skin. Not much laxity in the platysma muscle, so I came from the side, right? Natural neck rejuvenation, okay? So here's a gal who brought in a picture of her some years prior. Here she is about 40 years later. She doesn't need revolumization, but what she needs is her platysma firmed up, a little bit of skin excised, okay? And that was done in the office. Um, I don't want to bore people, but I hope you're getting the idea, right? Platysmoplasty for people who are... Uh, who have a lax platysma, etc. Now, this is a good teaching case. Here's a gal, if you look at her, the lower third of her face again, doesn't she look like she's lost volume, right? Remember the concept of letting a little bit of air out of a balloon? So, what do we do for her? Conservative surgery, revolumization, in other words, in order to do a natural neck lift, okay? Let's back up, let me back up. If you see like her jowls and the tissue under her chin, Okay, firmer, crisper, cleaner, neckline, jawline, chinline. Okay, I don't want to wear anybody out. Every customer <laughs> deserves a custom designed approach. Um, similar thing, this gal was done in the office. She's got some prominent jowls, so we need to address those. Uh, firm up her neck. Okay, this gal brought in this picture of when she was modeling, and here she is with a little, not much needed, a little conservative liposuction, etc. Okay, somebody asked me about incisions. What's the direct, direct neck lift? Every once in a while, I have someone come in who's had some thyroid operations or a tracheotomy at one time, and they say, I don't mind the scar under the chin. I don't want a big operation. I just some, I want something done in the office. A direct neck lift is when I just take out that extra skin right there, and they already have a scar, or they don't mind a scar, or they don't mind telling their friends, or they had a thyroid operation or something. So a direct neck lift can be done. Uh, in the office or at the surgery center, etc. Um, okay, and here's another example of a direct neck lift. I try to put the incision in the scar just under the chin. Certainly results in less loose skin of the neck. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about 
in session. How's everybody doing? Like 10 more minutes, okay? Is that all right? Are anybody getting hungry besides me or thirsty? Okay, so I talked about short incisions. I talked about incisions under the chin, around the ear, short incisions around the ears. Sometimes I use the traditional incision if there's lots of work to be done, lots of extra skin, or many different areas. I'll either make many small incisions or I'll make one longer incision. Here's a gal, side view. So this gal, back at the ranch, she, needed, she wanted her neck done and she also wanted some facial rejuvenation, so she got a longer incision. She would not have been a candidate. You see the difference? She would not have been a candidate for a, for a short scar because she wanted some facial work as well as the neck work. So this is a good opportunity for me to mention something. You know, it used to be that if you go to see a plastic surgeon, you kind of got two options. Nothing or a whole facelift, a complete facelift, people used to call it. Now we're at a point when somebody, where somebody can just, it's sort of component rejuvenation. You can have your neck done only, you can have your eyes done only, etc. So it's basically what you want. Now here's a gal that I saw who wanted more improvement in her neck, as well as her eyes and mid-face. So we address those areas. She had a longer incision, she wanted some neck improvement, she wanted some cheek improvement, so we go from there to there. Okay, so here's a gal with some laxity in her neck and the jowls and the cheeks, so we address those areas appropriately. Okay, so in both men and women, the natural neck lift I think can be very effective. So it's not just for women only, I ask guys to bring in their uh, pictures from high school and college and from their 20s, etc. This guy didn't mind us using his pictures. Now, if you look at his neck and the lower third of the face, doesn't he remind you of a loss of volume, right? Let a little bit of air out of the tires. Well, let's revolumize and reposition, okay? Kind of, for kind of a rejuvenated look. More vibrant look from the side. You can see his neck has some lax tissues. We want to show off the Adam's apple, show off the chin and neck, right? Here's a guy with some lax tissues of the neck and jowl area. We want to firm that area up. Similar thing. So this guy came in and said to me he wanted the turkeyectomy or the waddleectomy. So we just address what people want to address. So here's a guy, again, conservative, revolumization. Most men don't want a big dramatic change. They want to look more vibrant. They just want to look kind of stronger, a little more youthful. So we reposition tissues. Sometimes guys get that revolumized look, which is good. From the side, trim up the neck, cleaner, crisper neckline. And here's a, here's a guy who just wanted a little incision, so we firmed up his neck. So, plastic surgery. I'm gonna kind of round third base, okay? Is that all right? Five more minutes, okay? So, what do we do? What do we do in the office? Of course, skin care, skin rejuvenation, Botox, fillers and fat. Uh, some areas of liposuction and some surgical procedures. Now, what about going to the foundation? Let me go one layer deeper. I talked about the skin, I've talked about the fat, I've talked about the muscle. What about affecting the actual position of the chin, sometimes the nose, cheekbones? Here's a guy, um, good skin, he's got some extra fat, his chin is a little retrusive, he's got a great job, but he all, he's felt all his life that he, he kind of lacked the neck and lacked the chin. So I made one incision inside the lower lip. I made those little tiny incisions where the earlobe meets the chin and a little tiny incision underneath the chin to give him just a much more stronger look like that. And I brought his chin forward. Sometimes women would like their chin to come forward. We do a chin implant or bring the chin forward. Okay, here's a gal who felt that um, she never really had a pretty neck here she is in an early post-op period, bringing the chin forward. This gal felt like she never really had a chin or a neck, so that's all she wanted done. This gal came in and she wanted a fairly aggressive rhinoplasty. She wanted her nose reshaped. I, I said, how about if we just do something conservative for your nose and we do a little liposuction for your chin and affect that too. Mm -hmm. So really what we want is a more balanced face between the neck and the face, nose, etc. So a well-informed patient is a relaxed patient. When you come in and schedule consultation, we never want people to feel rushed. We can do the Vectra, meet the staff, talk to me, bring in pictures of prior 
years, bring in an idea, some idea of what you might want or the area that you want to affect. Now, in office procedures, we, we had some discussion about that. Let me just summarize. What happens in the office? People come in, they take oral pills, okay? That's by mouth. We don't start an IV. People get relaxed. We give them a sedative, a narcotic, sometimes a Benadryl and an antibiotic. Then we numb up the skin. Then we numb up the deeper tissues. In general, you need to be in good health and safety first, right? We, we don't want any problems. If someone, I feel, needs an anesthesiologist or another doctor there, we go to the surgery center or the hospital where there's another nurse around or two nurses, etc. Now, what about the surgery center? They can start an IV there. They give those same medicines right in the vein, a sedative, a narcotic, and an antibiotic. And it's me. I do some um, work in the surgery center that I don't do in the office, like breast implants, chin implants, things like that, longer procedures. It's possible to stay overnight at the surgery center. Now, what about the hospital? Anesthesiologist will be there, another nurse will be here, sometimes two, a surgical scrub tech, certain medical conditions. Overnight stay is possible. If you're gonna have something where insurance is covering one thing and the other part is cosmetic only, that's usually the hospital. Now, what about activities after surgery? You've got to rest for three days and three nights. Short walks are encouraged, get a little bit of fresh air, but in general, rest and take it easy for three days and three nights. On day four, a little more activity, but no heavy exercise. On day 11, slowly return to your regular activities. Now, one of the things that I want everybody to know, nothing in life is risk-free. It's possible to have problems, complications, and that's part of the reason why we follow people so closely afterward, and that's why we encourage you to comply with the resting protocol, etc. Hematomas, that's bleeding, bad scars, tissue loss, infection, wound dehiscences, the incisions coming apart, nerve problems, uneven result. I guarantee that no result will be perfect. So every result is imperfect, possible need or desire for further surgery. And of course, there are many factors influencing your result, the treatment operation selected, your inherent healing ability. I tell people I can make the incision, but the patient makes the scar. I can't make the scar for you. Compliance, you've got to pay attention and follow the resting period, surgeon skill, your preoperative appearance and condition is probably the single most important factor influencing your result. So, it's important. What are your goals, aesthetic concerns, how much time off can you take, can you tolerate risk, what is your existing condition and appearance, and what about cost factors? So all of these things we take into account. We never want people to feel rushed. Come in and get a custom designed approach. We're gonna round third base Part of what I love to do is the rejuvenation of the lower third of the face, right? The jowls, the neck. Well, the part, perhaps the epitome of that rejuvenation of that part of the face is cleft lip repairs. I do a lot of these in this country and overseas. Some of you may know about this. The Rotary Club or Alliance for Smiles sends me somewhere every year. And this community has been very supportive. We love to do those operations. They're very important for the kids and very important for the parents, of course. And I consider it probably the epitome of lower third plastic and recon lower third of the face plastic and reconstructive surgery. And many of you know about that, and I'm very grateful for the support the community's given. It's called Rotoplast or Alliance for Smiles. Here's a guy who came into our clinic in Columbia, 60 years old, before and after. And uh, I don't think we have time to talk about this part. But at this point, I'm gonna say thank you very much for your attention. We've got treats and snacks. Mm -hmm. So Jerrica, thank you so much. Avita, thank you so much. I want everybody to meet Candace, and everybody to meet Heather. And uh, if you have time, chat, have a drink, some treats, look at the Vectra, sign up for a consultation. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.